Thank you very much for that introduction, Elizabeth. And I just want to give a shout out as well to the people of St. Thomas of Beckett, where I was also uh, an assistant pastor there. Many of you know me. For those of you who don't, I'll just give a, a brief bio of what I did before I went into the priesthood, because it's actually relevant to my interest in stewardship. I am a Montrealer. I was raised in the West Island. I went to high school there, Pierrefonds Comprehensive High School, and then also Marinopolis College, and finally Concordia University, where I got my first degree in international business and finance. <laughs> yes, and it's a better preparation for the priesthood than you might think. <laughs> Being a commerce student studying business doesn't, it teaches you a certain number of skills, but it also teaches you a way to think, you might say. One thing for sure, you come out of that, you're no longer afraid of money. It's not a, you know, a fearful concept. You're familiar with this thing that we use as part of the social fabric of our lives. But having been a commerce student, my experience there was also my first experience of stewardship. I didn't know the word at the time, but it really was my first experience of that. Because while I was a student, I was also very involved in the student association. I was a treasurer, I was president in my final year. And if you're wondering what does that mean, well, at Concordia there are over 5,000 commerce students. Our association had 150 volunteers and a budget the year I was president of $450,000. So when you're 20 years old and you're responsible for that, you're playing with that kind of money, you develop, you, you really see something new about what these things mean. And that was a very important part of my education. As I say, one thing I learned is the importance of money, but I also learned the importance of people. Because if we hadn't have had that 150 volunteers, then all the cash would not have meant anything. Because there would have been nobody to use it with and for. On the other hand, if we'd have had the 150 volunteers for a budget of zero, then we would not have been able to serve this population to whom we were called to serve as well as we did. And so you begin to see that resources, people, and having a common mission is at the heart of stewardship. We focused on those three things. As I say, looking back, that was my first experience of stewardship. It was in many ways my first experience of being a pastor, and I'm not sure that I would be a priest today if I hadn't first had that taste of pastoring in that context at the age of 20 in business school. So as I say, as much as uh, it sounds funny, it really was a better preparation for the priesthood than you might think, and providentially a preparation for this day. I would like to begin my, uh, my formal part of the presentation by reviewing something that Bishop Crosby mentioned to us yesterday. That is the definition of a Christian steward. He gave us a definition that was taken from a pastoral letter written by the U.S. bishops. The definition of a Christian steward is one who receives God's gifts gratefully, cherishes and tends them in a responsible and accountable manner, shares them in justice and love with others, and returns them with increase to the Lord. I'm hoping this definition will come up over and over again during this day, because it's a beautiful statement of what it means to be a Christian steward. And my presentation will basically be about unpacking this definition for us. Follower of Jesus, I'm betting we're all followers of Jesus if we're here today. That's part of our identity. But sometimes we don't realize, or we have to come to awareness, that there are, in a sense, degrees of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I like to sort of break this down into three categories. <coughs> There are believers, and let's not, let's not consider this to be small potatoes. To be a believer, to have that sense in one's heart that there is truth here is extremely important. But there is another level, and that is the level of being a disciple. When you read the scriptures, 
When you hear the gospel proclaimed on Sunday, it's pretty rare you'll hear them say, I'm a believer in Jesus. But very often the gospels make reference to the disciples of Jesus. And finally, there is the group of stewards. Steward is, in a sense, the new term that we are introducing today, but one which I think we will quickly recognize is found throughout the New Testament. Just like when I was in business school, I didn't know it was called stewardship, but that's what we were doing. Many of us, maybe we haven't heard the word steward, but in fact, many of us, that's what we are or what we aspire to be. So what's a believer? Again, not something to be taken lightly. It is a very, very important group of people, and I would say a vast number of our <laughs> brothers and sisters are in this category. These are people who possess a basic emotional attachment to faith and to the church. Uh, that emotional attachment may be from the force of tradition, the way people were raised. It may be a, an echo of a powerful experience they've had of God. Whatever the source of it, they know on a, on a certain level, it's not just in their minds, but in their hearts, this is part of me and I am part of this. That is a believer. What we note, however, about people who are at this level and are, in a sense, merely at this level, is that very often in their faith, there is uh, an operation on sort of a passive, receptive mode. It doesn't mean that they don't care doesn't mean that they don't love the church. It's simply that being part of the church, being a believer, opens them up to receiving blessings. And already, as I say, that's huge. But very often, that's where it remains. It stays at that level. Part of stewardship is to help people be able to reverse that process so that they are invited, they are called, and they feel that they are able to be able to give back for the many gifts that they have received. So believers are at this initial level. Very important. We've all been there. All of us as kids, for example, when we were little, and we were you know, going to church, or maybe we started going to church when we were not so little, we went through a phase where we discovered the awe and wonder of faith. And it was like total gift being given to us. There's nothing wrong with being at this point of life. But, as I say, the scriptures don't mention believers too much. They mention disciples. There's a key Bible passage, a phrase of Jesus, a sentence that he said, which I think summarizes this very, very well. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. I'd like to reverse that just a little bit. I'm not trying to correct Jesus here, but I just want to reverse that a little and say it's not just the individual who enters the kingdom. It's that the kingdom enters the individual, and through the individual enters the world. That's part of discipleship. A disciple is someone who has made an active choice for their faith. Not just passive receptive or it's sort of the default mode, but rather, they have made an active choice, an active cooperation. A key element of disciple living, or discipleship, is that disciples live intentionally. It's not merely out of force of heaven. Disciples live intentionally. In fact, to be a disciple means that you have chosen a discipline. One has a disciplined life, a way of living that is intentional. So what is a steward? A steward, well, stewardship is part of discipleship. It's not a separate thing. So stewards are disciples. But they're disciples with a twist. The key attitude that a steward possesses is that a steward sees all things as gift. In other words, there's no sense of entitlement. There's no sense of, I deserve this. It's a sense of gratitude. See all things as gift, an attitude of gratitude. The uh, stewards also have a key action as part of their discipleship. A steward returns God's gifts to God with increase. 
sees the gift, says thank you, then wants to return it, wants to give something back, and do it for the Lord, and to do it with increase. There's a very important parable, which for me really sets the tone of what stewardship is. It's Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30. Uh, I'm only going to put up up to verse 27, but I'm, I'm going to read this parable out, and I'm sure it's one that we are all familiar with, even if the, the numbering doesn't catch us right away. So I just invite you to open your hearts. These are the words of Scripture. This is a gospel passage. So I invite you to, to listen attentively to the words of the Lord. Jesus said, For it will be as when a man going on a journey called his servants, and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also, he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not win. <coughs> So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sowed, and gather where I have not winnowed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. I consider this parable to be foundational for the concept of stewardship because it introduces what in stewardship is often known as the three T's. These kind of summarize the gifts that are given to us by God and are returned to God. These are the gifts of time, talent, and treasure. The master in this parable is going on a long journey. And so he calls his servants, his stewards, you might say. He calls them and he says, I will be gone for a certain time. I am giving this time to you. He also gives them treasure. What in the parable are called talents was actually a sum of money. So he is entrusting his property to them. And finally, we see that he gives it to them each according to the measure of their ability. One gets 10, you know, one gets five, or five, two, one. It, it, the, the numbers vary according to their ability. And so we see time, talent, and treasure. And each of those stewards has to use his time, has to use the treasure, and uses his talents in order to be able to give it back to his master with increase. They recognize it's not theirs. None of them go off and spend it. You know, they don't go off to the local I don't know, casino or they don't go buy a big car or something. They respect that it's a gift from another. And at the same time, they give it back with increase. Or at least two out of the three do. We know that for the third one, he still respects the master as the master 
He understands that, but the time, the talent, the treasure, the treasure is hidden. The time is not used for the master's purpose. The talents, even if there's only one little element of money that's given, the talent, the skills are not put to use. Even though the master had confidence in that person, the master was the gift, the source of that gift. So we are called as stewards to take a look at these elements of our life. As I said, when I was in the student association, we had these three things. We had the time to give. Everybody has the same 24 hours in the day. We had people with certain skills. I mean, we were all learning to be business grads, so we had certain skills that we were learning. And, well, we had the money. So between all those things, we were able to put together a lot of events, a lot of services, and really to assist our brothers and sisters in the student body with that common sense of mission. These three T's are found also in our parishes, through our volunteers, through the call to vocation, through our contributions, putting together our resources to build that community. Stewards, a person who has attained the level of stewardship, you might say, in their heart, looks at these three things. It doesn't stop there sees these as instruments in order to give back. First of all, stewardship is about the world. It's not just about the church. It is about the world. Stewardship, a good Christian steward, has a certain relationship with the society around them. I'm going to put up a whole list of ways in which a stewardship mentality affects and improves our world. First of all, a good steward recognizes their own life is a gift from God. And so, an attitude of wanting to take care of one's health, get decent exercise, is actually part of stewardship. It's stewardship of the body we have been given. There, if, uh, sometimes if we find that our health is failing, you know, one thing that we can do nowadays, this may sound like an odd example, but signing a medical mandate so that someone else can assist us in our decisions should we not be able to make them on our own. A scary thought for many people. But a stewardship mentality says, I want to help others who are called to make those decisions. If any of you have ever had to make those decisions for someone you know and love, you know that if things are unclear, if this sort of thing doesn't exist, it's tough. It's tough. It's a service to others to set something up like that. Personal study. To constantly grow in our minds, in our knowledge. That is another gift we have from God. The ability to reason, the ability to choose. And so the nourishment of that dimension of our life is part of the stewardship of the gift we have been given. Just good old-fashioned neighborliness care for those around us, getting to know our neighbors and helping look out for our local community, getting involved in that community. Where would Canadian society be without the armies of volunteers that exist, helping out in so many different associations and clubs and societies? In terms of stewardship of our money, well, nowadays with the uh, investment crisis, that may be a little bit harder, but at the same time, we do know that Money is a reality in our lives, and we are called to exercise responsible use of it, stewardship of it. I put up RRSPs as an example, you know, saving for our future, and also having a will, having a will, recognizing that, because you know, when you make a will, you recognize that it really is all gift, and you're not taking it with you. <laughs> Who am I going to give it back to with increase? It's part of a mentality. It's part of a steward would have no problem, no hesitation, would not see this as a scary thing, writing a will. Would recognize that it's part of good stewardship of the blessings they receive. The upkeep and maintenance of their goods. So that the stuff that they have, you know, they, they, they know their car is not polluting because they've kept it up as part of their stewardship for their community. 
As a final point, I have social justice, voting, and spending. Have we ever considered that the right to vote is a gift given to us by God? As the scriptures say, all authority comes from God. If we have that right to participate in our society, when we vote, do we do so with that intentional side of being a disciple? Or is it sort of force a habit? When we spend our money, if we knew, for example, that a particular manufacturer was engaged in unjust practices, child labor, or what have you, would that change the way we spend our money? For something as simple as buying a pair of shoes, social justice thinking is part of stewardship in our world. I have a dream that in our community, one day, all of those who aren't Catholics, or maybe who don't care too much for the church, will nevertheless say to themselves, boy, you know, when uh, we need volunteers, we know where to go. We just call up our local Catholic parish because there's always somebody willing to help for a good cause. I have a dream that people will recognize Catholics as people of generosity, as good stewards in their community. They may not know the word stewardship, but they will recognize it in us. That would be an awesome dream and the ultimate wonderful source of a good reputation for our church in the world. <coughs> but stewards also offer their stewardship for God, because the gifts come from Him and we return them to Him. Prayer, and more prayer, is the start of the stewardship of our time. Prayer takes time. That's ultimately what it takes. Eucharistic worship on Sunday, for example, is what, an hour? Two, if you've got to get the kids ready and you've got to drive there and what have you. It's stewardship of our time to say to God, you have given me 168 hours this week, 24 times 7, 168, I give you back this in worship according to the way when you said, do this in remembrance of me. Presence at church activities. I didn't say getting involved. I just said presence when there's a parish function, an activity, something going on, and we're invited. We be there because our very presence is part of contribution to our community. It encourages others, and we may get something out of it too. Volunteering our time is a more active uh, participation in the life of our community. I put up entrepreneurship. I actually wanted to put up social entrepreneurship, but I was running out of room on the list. <laughs> What that means is not just volunteering to help somebody else, but to take the initiative in our community. When we see there's a need to be the, the builder of something new, there are those of us who have that particular skill. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to offer that to our community. Vocations. Care for special vocations. People who will dedicate their lives, in a sense, entirely to the Lord we have a special responsibility to care for them. And a steward recognizes, you know, everybody wants priests, for example. But very often it's, well, we want priests, as long as it's somebody else's son. You know, or not my grandson. That one over there, or not this one. A steward, on the other hand, recognizes that, no, no, it's, the, these people don't grow on trees. They come from our families, they come from us, and we're happy to encourage that. Sacrificial giving. That means giving money. That means giving actual resources. But it means not doing so simply because we're asked and we respond, but because we sit down and say, the Lord has blessed me, I'm going to give this back. We start from our ability to give, not necessarily from the express need of the other. We make our offering a sacrifice, not just a response. That's quite a list. I'm hoping it's giving some of us some ideas today. I'd like to shift gears now for a moment, because the topic of our, our conference here is not simply stewardship, but it is Renewing community. So what does the pastoral care of stewardship mean? It means, first of all, helping our community to come to full discipleship. If you folks are here, it's because you're leaders in your communities. 
And so, all together, we are called to help our communities go from the believer phase to the disciple phase, and the disciple phase to the steward phase, to help the community come to full stewardship. But as leaders in our communities, we are also called to ready our communities so that in their structures, they are ready to receive the good stewardship of the people. What does that mean? A little thought experiment I would like to propose to all of you. With this question, would we be capable of receiving the stewardship of our people if it was offered? Let's imagine that the Holy Spirit descends upon one of our parishes, you know, the tomorrow in great fervor, and everybody suddenly is flamed with zeal and shows up and says, you know, 2,000 people clog the parish phone lines and say, we're ready to give one hour a week to the Lord for this parish, for this community. <laughs> what would we do with all those people? <laughs> I mean, honestly, you know, once we'd filled up all the lectors and the Eucharistic ministers and got more catechists for faith first, then what would we do? You see, I am firmly convinced that the Holy Spirit wants to do that, that he wants to inflame the hearts of the people with this sense of generosity, with this sense of giving back. But we got to be ready to receive it. Well, the Holy Spirit's not going to do that to somebody just to make them frustrated. You know? We have to be ready to receive that stewardship. It would be great, for example, if we knew that of those thousand people, we could only really use 200 in our parish, but we were so connected to the local hospital, to the local schools, to the local charitable institutions, that we could direct people and say, we know there's a need there, we know there's a need there. We are so in tune with the needs of our world so that the church's mission is not simply limited to its four walls, but it goes beyond. If we are ready to receive the stewardship of people, then the Holy Spirit will send us people, will send us time, talent, and treasure. So renewing community means getting ready. As I say, the Holy Spirit wants to do this. I am convinced. And so there are some things we can do to get ready to be able to receive that. Really important start. We'll start with the money side. You can tell it's my business background coming out again. <laughs> Fiscal accountability. Transparency. So that in the parish, everybody knows and they feel co-responsible for the life of the parish. When the wardens get up to give the parish report, for example, financial report, is it an us versus them mentality? Sometimes the wardens feel that way. I've spoken to the wardens who feel like, oh gosh, we've got to give the report. This is terrible because it's a stressful time. Or the people, sometimes, I've been on the other end, sitting there going, okay, what do they want from me now? <laughs> us versus them, that's not stewardship. And so we, the parish, calls forth a positive response by demonstrating true fiscal accountability within our budgeting as well. We have budgets that are based on activities so that people can see, oh, the resources we give go to this project or that project or that project. We see that our money is tied with mission. That is part of the leadership in stewardship. Another big plus Parishes need to have clear and simple parish policies. Clear and simple. I remember when the Faith First program was getting started and we had to make decisions like, okay, what grade do you come in if you haven't been in before and how many years do you have to be in the program and what if you transfer to another church and how many parents meetings do there have to be? And, you know, and, and some parish policies were 10 pages long, single spaced. <laughs> clear and simple so that we can all be on the same wavelength so that we're all having a common vision and very importantly communication that works one complaint I, I sometimes hear now that I work at the archdiocese from the parishes is we don't know what's going on downtown 
And sometimes I can tell you downtown doesn't know what's going on in the parish. <laughs> sometimes the people wonder what's going on in their community. The bulletin has a certain amount of information space. Parishes can have websites, email lists, but more than having the tools, communication that works to really invest in taking the time to be able to communicate well. In our larger communities with lots of people involved, and of course with a stewardship mentality, that will be all of them, to have descriptions of roles so that if somebody who comes forward as a steward will be able to say very often one of the first questions a person who has a giving heart asks is, what do you want me to do? Just tell me what it is I need to do, and I'll do it. And that's often where, in our parishes, in our leadership, we say, oh, uh, well, I know what I want you to do, but uh, I'm not quite sure how to communicate it. So to be able to offer people that, it's not a job description. It's a tool to help them give back. Training and support, the care of those who are involved, both encouraging them by, you know, when we offer somebody a training session of some kind, it's a way of saying, we are investing in you. We believe in you. We believe you have the talent, the ability to give back. Finally, as I say, a parish needs to have a sense of mission to the broader community. It has to reach out. I remember this when I was, again, associate pastor at St. Thomas of Beckett, and we used to get calls from the West Island Volunteer Bureau, and they would say, can we put up posters on your bulletin board, because we need volunteers for this, that, or the other thing. Now, this is not a church-based organization, it's a secular organization. And so I was always impressed by that, and one time I asked, because they would call fairly often, one time I asked, you know, why are you... Why are you calling us? I mean, we're a church, and you're not a religious organization. And they said, and this is really fascinating, they said, we know that we get more responses from posters on church bulletin boards than we do from posters anywhere else. Wow. Now there, there's a group that recognizes in their own enlightened self-interest that a Christian stewardship is real. I remember having a discussion with the, when I was chaplain at the Lakeshore with the foundation and with the volunteer, uh, well, with the various administration people, and we were discussing the role of religion in the hospitals and the chapel and should it, what kind of chapel should we have because we were building one at the time. And I raised the point, I said, my friends, if you were to take all the volunteers who are involved in the auxiliary services and you were to remove from that list all those who go to church, how many would be left? And if you were to take the list of all your donors, and you were to remove from that all the people who worship God, whether Christian, Jewish, whatever, what would be left? And you're honestly sitting here asking me what the value of religion is in our society? And that's when they realized, yeah, there's something there. And how much more could there be if our people if all our communities truly were enlivened by the Spirit in this way, I really believe we have a duty as community leaders to get our parishes ready to receive this movement of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is waiting to go. He's waiting to move. And it's up to us to just, you might say, open the stopper and let it pour forth. So I've been asked to give you a couple of reflection questions. I'll leave these up here for your own discussion. Can we think of other or perhaps more specific ways of exercising stewardship for the world and for God? So I had that long list earlier for the world, for God. I gave some examples. Can we think of others? And in becoming stewards, the church has a role to play. How can our communities become more ready to receive the good stewardship of people. So feel free to discuss the points I already raised or to come up with other ones on your own. I thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you today. Stewardship, as you can tell, is a passion of mine, not just because I'm a business grad, but because I see it as part of our mandate as brothers and sisters in Christ.
and we want to return all that to the Lord with increase and with gratitude. So thank you very, very much.